Good morning. While our participants uh, take the stage, uh, a little background for you, uh, because so often we uh, take the built environment for exactly uh, what it is, built, rather than something that we are uh, still participating in or still uh, evolving toward. In this July, marked, uh, this may come as a surprise to some of you, uh, the 10th year since the passage of the Sarbanes-Oxley accounting law. Um, that, you may remember, came in the wake of, these words will sound quaint to you, Enron, WorldCom, and elsewhere. Since the passage of this regulation, um, a lot of folks in the business world have said that complying with the law uh, is expensive and burdensome, uh, perhaps that it's ineffective, and um, they quite uh, insistently ask uh, the rhetorical question, if this thing was so effective, can someone please explain Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns to me? On the other hand, reformers argue that the law's effect is profound in the way it's reshaped attitudes, that it has in fact changed the culture of corporate governance and that the need for fundamental change in boardroom behavior was, was a message that actually transcended the letter of the law, if you will. And uh, it was certainly an idea that lit a fire under the corporate responsibility movement. I can tell you that with, with uh, no uncertain terms. So the question before us right now, you've just gotten out your, uh, your cell phones to, to address uh, that sort of industrial or professional question that we were dealing with. But before I introduce our participants this morning, I'd like to bring up the polling question that's before us this morning, which is, if I could get that up, please. Has mandated corporate disclosure done more harm than good? That is the question that our participants will be grappling with this morning. And do we have the, uh, the details also on where they text their answer for that? Same as before, okay? Commit 12 to 90206. If you could put that back up so that folks can answer that while I uh, let them know who is joining us this morning. Obviously, um, no debate about Sarbanes-Oxley uh, could be as robust uh, as, this, as uh, the one we're having this morning without the, uh, the eponymous author of that bill. Senator Paul Sarbanes is with us this morning. He was elected to the United States House of Representatives uh, in 1970 from the 4th District of Maryland, which I want to say is Annapolis, not possibly included in Annapolis. Are you from Annapolis originally? No, or represented no, Annapolis? Not, uh, no. In the, in the State House? Possibly not. Um, and was on the uh, House Judiciary Committee, from which he was selected by his Democratic colleagues uh, on the House Watergate Committee to introduce the first article of impeachment. Uh, for obstruction of justice against uh, President Richard Nixon. In 1976, he was elected to the United States Senate, re-elected uh, five or six times, I want to say the longest serving senator from the state of Maryland. And he was, as I said, the Senate sponsor of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act uh, of 10 years ago, of 2002. To his immediate right, Laura Lee Martin uh, is uh, uh, with us from uh, from Jones Lang LaSalle. Her present position is CFO. She's a, a graduate of Oregon State University with an MBA from the University of Connecticut. She was at GE Capital uh, for a number of years and worked briefly with the consumer, uh, in consumer products, but was assigned to the real estate group, which is how uh, she ended up uh, subsequently at Heller Financial, uh, rising to president in the real estate division. And in 1995, she agreed to become the corporate CFO, where she assisted with their IPO in 1998. The company was subsequently purchased by GE and uh, brought her to her current state as CFO of Jones Lang LaSalle. Uh, to her immediate right, Mark Calabria is Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute. Before joining Cato, he spent six years as a member of the senior professional staff of the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. Before that, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Regulatory Affairs at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and also held a variety of positions at Harvard University's Joint Center for Housing Studies and the National Association of Home Builders. And last but not least, John Allison. John Allison is the retired chairman and CEO of BB&T Corporation, the 10th largest financial services holding company headquartered in the U.S. And during his tenure as CEO from 1989 to 2008, 
that BB&T grew from four and four billion and change to one hundred and fifty-two billion dollars in assets. And in March two thousand nine, he joined the faculty of Wake Forest as a distinguished professor of practice uh, at the business school. He was recognized by the Harvard Business Review as one of the top 100 most successful CEOs in the world over the last decade. And in June, he was selected as the new president of the Cato Institute. Uh, so he and Mark uh, are both part of that esteemed think tank in Washington, DC. Uh, I am not here to monopolize this conversation. I am here to uh, encourage our participants to, to mix it up ideally to shed more uh, light than heat, but I also strongly encourage all of you to not be shy about raising your hands. As, as my friend Richard said, the point here is to integrate this debate and what you take away from it into the structures of everyday life for you in your professional lives and to ask yourselves, uh, what hath we wrought and where are we? So without further ado, I would like to begin with Senator Paul Sarbanes. Thanks, Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning. Can can you hear all right with this microphone? This is a nice crowd. I used to do these forums in high school auditoriums across my state. So I came in one night, there's a group of about three hundred people, which is quite a quite a sizable crowd for those kind of activities. And I got to the microphone, I said, can you hear me in the back? And a woman in the rear of the auditorium says, we can't hear you. At which point a woman sitting right down front, literally right in front of me, leaped to her feet, turned to the woman in the back and said, I'll trade places with you. So I knew what kind of evening lay ahead of me at that point. I'm very pleased to be here with you today and looking forward to this uh, discussion. I obviously uh, am, am very much in the negative on the proposition that corporate transparency and disclosure requirements have done more harm than good. Uh, I mean, I'd just turn that around and say more good than harm, but I want to take you back just for a moment to set the stage for Sarbanes-Oxley and what we did uh, to the fall of 2001. In October of 2001, Enron, the seventh largest corporation in the country, uh, restated their earnings. In November, they restated them again. Enron, of course, had been showing a 20% increase in earnings quarter to quarter. I mean, it was, just, it was a straight line going up, just like that. Apparently a phenomenal performance. And then at the beginning of December, Enron filed for bankruptcy. And that began the whole process. It turned out Enron was the canary in the mine shaft. A number of major companies were engaged in convoluted, often fraudulent accounting devices to inflate earnings, hide losses, Drive up, stock price, uh, drive up stock prices. Paul Volcker and Arthur Levitt, writing in the Wall Street Journal, uh, warned uh, the country of the danger of falling into a collective amnesia toward the real pain and loss that investor, investors suffered. Over a period of months, market values of public companies fell by some trillions of dollars. Thousands of jobs were lost, retirement savings dried up. Uh, the journal surveying the situation at the time said the scope and scale of the corporate transgressions of the late 1990s now coming to light exceed anything the U.S. has witnessed since the years preceding the Great Depression. 
according to Fortune magazine, phony earnings, inflated revenues, conflicted Wall Street analysts, directors asleep at the switch. This isn't just a few bad apples we're talking about here. This, my friends, is a systemic breakdown. And Money Magazine described the situation in these words, a total failure by everyone, a complete breakdown in the system, in all the checks and balances. Well, that was the challenge the Senate Banking Committee faced as we began to examine the situation. Over the first few months of 2002, we held a series of intensive hearings in the committee. Uh, we brought in really, I think, the sort of the best people from across the country to testify and in front of the committee. We held 10 hearings, as a matter of fact. Uh, we started off with the five former chairmen of the SEC, appointed by both Democratic and Republican presidents to lay out their analysis of the situation, which pretty much agreed with one another. I mean, they, they, they were very close together in what the problems were. And as the hearings progressed, it was increasingly clear uh, that there was a considerable agreement on the nature of the problem. Inadequate oversight of auditors, lack of auditor independence, weak corporate governance procedures, inadequate disclosure provisions. Ken Lay was telling his employees shortly before Enron's first financial restatement, quote, my personal belief is that Enron is an incredible bargain at current prices. He did not tell them, and he was not required required at that point, he, he would have been now, to tell them he had unloaded a substantial amount of common stock, of his holdings of common stock in the previous uh, two months. You had stock analyst conflict of interest. The stock analysts in the investment houses were sending buy recommendations to their clients with respect to particular stock, and then they were emailing one another uh, saying what a dog that particular stock was. So their privately held opinion was 180 degrees at odd with, with what, they were telling, uh, what they were telling their clients. So they'd say, well, that stock is a dog. Actually, they used other phrases, but I cleaned it up a little bit for the, for the sake of the presentation. Uh, so we, we looked into this, obviously, and then we, here's what we did, and I want to emphasize this because much of it, in effect, relates to the morning's uh, topic. Lynn Turner testified in front of our committee, a very able former chief accountant of the SEC, uh, has said that for a capital market to work effectively, it must provide investors with high quality, timely, and complete information that is correct. The U.S. securities markets and the laws pertaining to the securities markets basically depend on disclosure. In other words, provide the information and make sure the financial statements are honest and reliable and then the investors will make their own decision. Now, if the investors are not being given honest information, if, the, if there's not transparency and full disclosure, you begin to undercut, in my opinion, and erode the integrity of our capital markets. The integrity of the U.S. capital markets has always been a very strong economic asset for this country. It's really essential to the workings of the economic system and it's essential to the preeminent position the U.S. capital markets have held, held worldwide. 
So these are the measures we took, and you, as you will see, they, they relate in many respects to the question of getting full and complete and accurate uh, information. Uh, first of all, we ended the self-regulation of the auditing profession, established the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. The legislation applies only to public companies, and it was related to this concern about protecting the capital markets, ensuring that the capital markets were honest and fair. So it doesn't apply, if you're not a public company, the, the law does not apply to you. Now what has happened is many provisions of the law have come to be considered best practices, so the extent of it has reached out beyond the public company arena. But the law itself applies only to public companies. Now accounting firms that audit public companies must register with the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. The board has broad uh, discretion to set auditing standards to investigate and when necessary impose penalties. Uh, this really was made necessary by the failure of self-regulation to work. Uh, the industry was doing self-regulation, but it really was not meeting the criterion of independence, uh, actually best spelled out by the Supreme Court in a decision in the early 1980s. That decision read in part, by certifying the public reports that collectively depict a corporation's financial status, the independent auditor assumes a public responsibility transcending any employment relationship with a client. This public watchdog function demands that the accountant maintain independence from the client at all times and requires complete fidelity to the public trust. So the independent auditor, and of course public companies are required to have a certified statement from, independent, from an independent auditor, is there really as, as a critical watchdog in the workings of this system. And they are supposed, of course, to provide some assurance that the reports are accurate, full, and complete. And the Supreme Court has spelled out this responsibility of the auditing profession of public companies, although they had drifted away from it. Uh, secondly, to develop auditor independence, because you want to enhance the auditor's position to be critical of the company's financial bookkeeping, if, in fact, that is deserved. They're there in a, in a screening, in an oversight role with respect uh, to the company. We try to enhance the auditor's independence by addressing the problem of auditors who are doing a broad range of consulting services for the companies they were auditing. They came in, they were auditors of these companies, but at the same time, they were doing a significant business with the same companies on the consulting side. And in fact, in the late 1970s, core auditing and accounting fees accounted for 70% of revenues, management advisory services for 12%. By the end of the century, by 200, the pattern had been reversed. A third came from auditing and over half was coming from management advisory services. Of course, the concern was their judgment on the auditing side was being affected by their involvement on the management consulting side. In fact, you had some instances in which auditors had set up evaluation uh, programs for the, for the company, and then they came along and audited the company, <coughs> which included examining the valuation they had placed on various assets. So the, here they were as the auditors 
passing on the very work, an important part of the work, that they had done as management consultants. So there was a perceived that there was a, a conflict of interest, and we tried to address that. Uh, we tried to make the audit committees more independent. Much of what we were doing was trying to build these safeguards, these checks and balances, into the corporate structure to make it an, a normal part of the business. And one of the things we sought to do was to make the audit committees more independent. So the legislation provides that uh, audit committees would be made up of independent directors. The auditors now are hired and fired and their compensation is set not by the management of the company, but by the auditing committee of independent uh, directors. We sought to enhance the role and in independence of the audit committee, and I think generally that is perceived as having worked uh, pretty well. We required CEOs and CFOs to vouch directly for the accuracy of their company's financial statements. Uh, we require numerous disclosures in the legislation, including prop disclosure of trades and company stock by management, 10% shareholders, disclosure of material off-balance sheet transactions. So it was, it was all designed to actually enhance corporate transparency and disclosure and therefore to restore investor confidence in the workings of our capital markets. Well, we've been at it for more than a decade. There have been some problems along the way, but those are being adjusted. Uh, the cost of compliance with the Section 404 has has been addressed, and those costs have been brought down in, in, in significant ways. Um, Business Week commenting said, despite the grumbling, there's increasing evidence that reform has been well worth the trouble. Already intense scrutiny of accounting methods and internal controls has unearthed lingering problems in the way companies operate. And fixing weak financial controls has nipped a lot of accounting problems in the bud. Christopher Cox, who was a chairman of the SEC, uh, examining developments, said, we have come a long way since 2002. Investor confidence has recovered. There's greater corporate accountability. Financial reporting is more reliable and transparent. Auditor oversight is significantly improved. So I think all of that has been an important step forward in restoring confidence in the workings of our capital markets. And I think more and more people are coming to feel that way. Sam DiPiazza, the CEO of PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, did a survey study of 1,200 chief executives worldwide. And he was trying to find out their view of the mandated compliance expenditures that the companies had to make to meet the standards that were in the legislation. Uh, they, they basically broke it into two possibilities, that the cost involved onerous requirements, or B, that, the, that they were really investments offering significant opportunities and sources of competitive advantage. By about a two to one margin, those who saw it as an investment instead of just a burden, uh, they outranked those who saw it as a burden by about two to one. They viewed it as tightening their operations and helping them 
uh, to manage risk. So I would submit that we've made important strides forward, that uh, transparency and accountability and disclosure have been important elements of strengthening the capital markets. Uh, let me close with just this comment, which I particularly want to put forth because of this fine publication that the forum people put out, Corporate Responsibility, the Corporate Responsibility magazine. I had a chance to go through some of these magazines, and I was uh, quite impressed by the range of topics and the thoughtfulness with which these topics were examined. But I want to leave you with a quote put forth by the chairman of the SEC, Bill Donaldson, who I think spoke eloquently about these matters. Donaldson, you know, was named uh, chairman of the SEC by President Bush, confirmed by the Senate. He had been uh, head of the Yale School of Management. He had headed one of the leading investment uh, banking houses in, in the country. He had quite a distinguished career. And Donaldson, at the time speaking, rejected suggestions, including in the press, that the recent crackdowns on corporate and executives by criminal and civil authorities, including the commission, have discouraged honest risk-taking. Donald Donaldson went on to say, on the contrary, Sarbanes-Oxley and the other steps that have accompanied it will lead to an environment where honest business and honest risk-taking will be encouraged and rewarded. And he went on to return to this fundamental point, which really the CR echoes in their raising standards and raising performance, which is their sort of logo for their magazine. Uh, Donaldson said, successful corporate leaders must strive to do the right thing in disclosure, in governance, and otherwise in their business. And they must instill in their corporations this attitude of doing the right thing. They should make this approach part of the company's DNA. So this process of restoring honest, transparent, ethical business practices and the indispensable safety mechanisms to keep them in place, the internal processes which help to assure that they're honest and transparent continues. In my view, we can do no less because the integrity of our capital markets and the confidence of our investors and therefore the underlying strength of our economy are at stake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. We'll go to questions uh, at the end. In the interest of time, I want to bring up Mark Calabria. And after Mark speaks, if we could have the results from the poll from the first question so that we can have the final results after. Mark Calabria. Thank you. Let me first say, uh, in and recognize five out of my seven years as staff on the banking committee. Senator Sarbanes was the senior Democrat. Uh, and I look back on that commit time finally, while we had many disagreements, we were not disagreeable about it. Uh, and one of, the, one of the drivers for my decision to finally two years after his departure to make my own departure from the committee uh, is I think that atmosphere of working out disagreements in an agreeable manner unfortunately left with him. But I do want to recognize uh, his commitments to that. And in that spirit, I also want to make clear my criticisms are not of the man, but they are of the bill. So uh, with that, I want to thank him. And as we would say in the Senate, I want to thank the, uh, my very good friend from the great state of Maryland. Uh, before getting into the impact, I do want to review a little bit. The senator talked about what some of the bill does. Uh, and despite the topic of the panel being transparency, uh, much of the bill is actually about the regulation of auditors. For instance, as was mentioned, the creation of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. 
Uh, there are also requirements that you have auditor rotation, uh, re restrictions on provision of non-audit services, auditor independence, and again, much of the bill is actually about auditing. Uh, yes, there is a Title IV, one out of 11 titles that deals directly with disclosure, and this contains the infamous 404, which uh, requires management, among other things, to attest to the effectiveness of internal controls. Now, there are also increased criminal penalties in the bill uh, for fraud, white-collar crimes, uh, and of course, it would not be Congress if there were not several studies and reports in the bill. Uh, I will note here that despite the failure of the credit rating agencies in detecting problems at companies such as Enron and WorldCom, we can remember that they rated their debt and their, and their companies very highly just before the failure, uh, and the rating agencies also, in my opinion, played a very large role in the recent crisis in the subprime mortgage market. Despite all of that, uh, the approach of Sarbanes-Oxley toward the rating agencies was to require a study. Um, and of course, uh, without, in my opinion, addressing the fundamentally flawed regulatory structure, which in a, my opinion has turned the rating agencies essentially into a duopoly. And this is a theme I want to come back to repeatedly. The choice was not Sarbanes-Oxley to do nothing, just as our recent uh, choice was not Dodd-Frank to do nothing. Our choice would have been to actually address the flaws in our financial and monetary systems, which I believe we did not. The heart of Sarbanes-Oxley, subjecting auditors to both a registration requirement and an examination by the oversight board, it's worth remembering that a very similar scheme exists previously for investment advisors, yet that scheme did not prevent either the Madoff or Stanford scandals. The predictable outcome is that Sarbanes-Oxley's increased regulation of auditors would reduce competition and increase concentration among auditors. And in fact, academic studies have found that post Sarbanes-Oxley, for Fortune 1000 companies, their average audit fees increased 67%. In my opinion, this is probably the most bizarre aspect of Sarbanes-Oxley. You start from the premise that you believe auditors misbehaved, so you by law increase the demand for their services and erect substantial barriers to entry that massively benefit the same incumbent firms you believe were behind the crisis. Uh, let me again emphasize that despite Sarbanes-Oxley's ban on auditors performing non-audit work for the same companies, audit fees overall went up. Even with the decline in non-audit business, the audit fees charged increased more than enough to offset this decline. And not surprisingly, given Sox's reduction in competition among auditors, auditing fees went up most among the largest firms. But then again, a basic understanding of economics would have predicted such a result. Now, this increased cost might be worthwhile if audit quality increased. If anything, the opposite appears to be the case. Reported instances of corporate fraud have increased post Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, the reports of the oversight board suggest that Sarbanes-Oxley itself might have contributed to actually this decrease in audit quality. One of the obsessions with Sarbanes-Oxley is increasing so-called auditor independence by forcing a company to change auditors regularly. However, deficiency reports from the oversight board indicate that a longer tenure for auditors actually reduces deficiencies rather than increasing them. We have to keep in mind that auditor independence is not free. It comes at the price of the auditor understanding of both the company and the industry in question. By deciding in favor of a contrived version of independence, Sarbanes-Oxley has embraced auditor ignorance. It is worth noting that the issue of auditor independence has been subjected to repeated analysis in the academic literature. The conclusions of that literature so contradict the provisions of Sarbanes-Oxley that one of the leading academics in corporate governments, Yale Law Professor Roberto Romero, has labeled them quack corporate governance. Let me touch for just a moment upon Sarbanes-Oxley's infamous section 404, which requires management to attest to the effectiveness of an internal controls and to have those internal controls evaluated. First, do we really doubt that CEOs intended on committing fraud would be deterred? If 404 had been in place, I think it's a safe bet to say that Ken Lay, CEO of Enron, or even Frank Rain, CEO of Fannie Mae, would have happily signed those, those uh, documentations and moved forward with their frauds. Now, in the case of Fannie Mae, there was a little less considerable uh, emphasis in terms of addressing fraud, because despite the professed uh, concern about commitment to disclosure and transparency, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have been repeatedly protected and excluded from the securities laws, despite their own f repeated instances of fraud. Uh, if we believe, however, that these laws are for the protection of the benefit of investors, it's hard for me to believe that investors in Fannie Mae did not merit the same protections and uh, makes me question whether these exclusions were worthwhile. Uh, which brings me to one of the fundamental flaws of Sarbanes-Oxley and more generally of our bodies of security laws. Usually it is not management that pays. It is the shareholders. Or to me more exact, the plaintiff lawyers bring a shareholder class action. 
management agrees to have the firm pay previous shareholders at the expense of current shareholders, and of course, lawyers take a huge cut off the top. This is the nature of Sarbanes-Oxley. It creates impossible subjective standards that can always be contested after the fact so that enterprising lawyers can make out like bandits while investors get left holding the bag. Of course, we are told the opposite, that's, that investors are better off after Sarbanes-Oxley, and I'm going to come back to whether this claim actually withstands empirical testing, uh, because I do think our public policy should be science-based. Uh, but if indeed investors are made better off, why wouldn't firms voluntarily adopt these corporate governance standards if they increase shareholder value, such would make it easier and cheaper to raise capital? Now, in some instances, they do. We should remember that it wasn't the SEC that created financial disclosure or good corporate governance. It was a combination of demands by then private exchanges and corporations seeking charters that were attractive to investors. Before Sarbanes-Oxley, and even before the creation of the SEC, corporation law was largely the domain of states. This competition among states allowed for a process of trial and error as to what works best to protect investors. If states had poor corporate governance regimes, such was reflected in share prices, and this has been confirmed with empirical testing. Sarbanes-Oxley, in my opinion, takes the arrogant approach that its authors know the best way to address corporate governance and imposes a one-size-fits-all. I believe a little more modesty would be in order, as one does not know ahead of time the optimal corporate governance framework. To truly protect investors, the provisions of Sarbanes-Oxley should allow corporations to opt out by a shareholder vote. Such would demonstrate whether shareholders actually valued these provisions or not. As with most of what comes out of Washington, the defenders of Sarbanes-Oxley regale us with its many imagined benefits, but conveniently ignore its costs. There are no free lunches in public policy. Any piece of legislation has costs and benefits. The question always matters about the net. From the SEC's own estimates, publicly traded companies spend on average over two million annually in direct costs complying with Sarbanes-Oxley. Estimates from economists at the University of Rochester conclude that Sarbanes-Oxley reduced shareholder wealth by about $1.4 trillion. This was supposedly about helping investors. Sarbanes-Oxley has had the direct role of reducing the competitiveness of America's capital markets. Companies around the world used to flock to U.S. exchanges. There has historically been a significant benefit for foreign companies to cross-list on a U.S. exchange. After Sarbanes-Oxley, that benefit significantly declined. This impact shows up not only in stock valuations, but in the willingness of firms to go public on U.S. exchanges. Prior to Sarbanes-Oxley, U.S. initial public offerings averaged 27% of global IPOs. Since Sarbanes-Oxley, that percentage has fallen to 12%, over more than half. Sarbanes-Oxley has not only reduced the number of firms going public, it has also encouraged firms to go dark, that is to delist their shares. The number of such voluntary delistings more than doubled after the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley. If the proponents of Sarbanes-Oxley had hoped to protect investors with more mandated disclosure, the results have likely been a lower level of disclosure on average as more firms choose to either remain private or to delist. Perhaps the most damning fact about Sarbanes-Oxley is not its cost and its negative impact on capital formation, but the simple and indisputable fact that it neither eliminated corporate fraud nor ended financial bubbles and panics. I mentioned earlier the Sarbanes-Oxley approach to credit aiding agencies was demand a study. It is also worth remembering that what, one of the things that sunk Enron was a variety of off-balance sheet vehicles that obscured their real risk. But there's fundamentally diff little difference between these accounting games and the off-balance sheet vehicles that, say, Citibank post Sarbanes-Oxley used to warehouse subprime mortgages. It did not change those fundamental accounting mistakes. The fundamental flaw behind Sarbanes-Oxley, in my opinion, is an absolute avoidance of addressing asset bubbles. Let us recall the problems that Enron, WorldCom, and others did not come to light until after the burst into the dot-com bubble. These discoveries of fraud did not cause the bubble to burst. What did cause that bubble to burst was a reversal in the flood of easy money by the Federal Reserve that drove up equity prices. Despite his concerns about irrational exuberance, Greenspan pushed the money supply to increase at a rate far in excess of the growth of the underlying economy. Uh, it's funny if we think about it now, but there was a time when everybody worried about Y2K problems. And the Federal Reserve approach to that was to flood the system with liquidity. That liquidity ended up in the stock market. When that liquidity was drawn, the stock market bubble burst. Uh, now, Sarbanes-Oxley's attempt to restore confidence without actually changing the fundamentals of our financial system, in my opinion, leaves investors all the more vulnerable next time. 
Lastly, we should remember that the actions which Sarbanes-Oxley was a reaction to, the financial frauds at Enron, WorldCom, and others were already crimes before Sarbanes-Oxley. In fact, several individuals were convicted and sentenced under laws that existed before Sarbanes-Oxley. At the time of his death, Ken Lay was facing a sentence of up to 45 years in jail. Putting more crimes in the book simply because other crimes were committed strikes me hardly as an effective deterrent. Finally, it's worth noting that Sarbanes-Oxley's mandated changes to the Corporate Governance Board were already standard practice among U.S. corporations. In fact, Enron's board, before its failure, was already compliant with Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, all of its audit members of the large committee were independent, and many were leading financial experts. It would appear that the proponents of Sarbanes-Oxley believe that corporate boards should be more like Enron's rather than less. I will also note, in 2000, the magazine uh, chief executive ranked Enron's board one of the top five in the country based on these very same measures of what good corporate governance is. So again, if your measures of corporate governance start to correlate with the same firms that repeatedly get in trouble, such as Enron and Fannie Mae, I think ultimately you need to rethink what you believe good corporate governance is. Uh, with that, thank you. I appreciate it and look forward to the questions. Before we go to uh, part two with Laura Lee and John, I wonder if we could put up the uh, results from the pre-debate poll, if we have that. Uh, no, we need the one on corporate disclosure. Has mandated, yep, that was it. Has it done more harm than good? The audience, 60%, no. So uh, a quarter of you think it has done more harm than good. A little less than two-thirds think it's done more good than harm, to use the senator's construction. Senator, I want to start with a question for you before we go to the second part, and that is simply this. If Sarbanes-Oxley was the greatest thing since sliced bread, can you please explain to me Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers? Well, Sarbanes-Oxley doesn't guarantee you against, you know, other things that may happen, as witness the, the 2008-2009 problems, which I think were basically problems of uh, risk management. I mean, we, we, just, we tried to deal with a very clear objective, which was to make sure that accurate, complete, uh, financial reports were being given. So investors at least got that clear picture of the, of the company's functioning. Now, that doesn't guarantee that they're not going to make bad business decisions, which I think the, the most recent difficulties, that's what that reflected. There was very little um, misstatement of figures in the, in the, in the last uh, problem. That all went back to the, to the earlier period. But it's not a panacea. I mean, there's still, there's still difficulties that can arise, and as, as we have seen. Fair enough. Mark, for you, um, did I hear you? I, I believe that the adjective infamous was invoked a few times with respect to uh, to uh, section 404. Did I hear you, and forgive me, there's a little bit of an echo, so it's, it's, uh, it's sometimes hard to catch every nuance, but did I hear you suggest that Ken Lay would have happily ignored that and signed? Uh, yeah, and so, that, so, it, so my question to you is this. Uh, the infamous section 404, is it irrelevant or onerous? Which one is it? I don't think it's impossible to be both. I mean, the Explain. question is, what is the relevancy to have you changed corporate performance? You can have people go through an exercise, and that exercise can be expensive, so there could be an onerous nature into which resources are spent on that exercise, but the question would be, does that exercise actually deter wrongdoing? And it may or may not deter wrongdoing. I think those are two separate questions. So my argument would be, it is costly, and it is not an effective deterrent against corporate wrongdoing. And again, as I mentioned, Ken Lay was looking at 45 years in jail had he lived. 
Now, that strikes me as a far bigger deterrent. I also think there's a problem, as I mentioned earlier to me, that's a core problem with so much of security law, which is, okay, you violate 404, somebody brings a shareholder suit. Now, the SEC almost never takes anybody to court. They settle everything. So the company says, well, you know, we don't admit any wrongdoing. We'll have the current shareholders write you a very big check to the old shareholders. And so I would say, to me, one of the fundamental flaws of Sarbanes-Oxley securities law, which is, to me, a fundamental tenet of justice should be the wrongdoer is the person who pays, and the person who is wronged is compensated. And that's not the way it works. Management should pay, not the current shareholders. So you're in favor of a, a stronger SEC with I'm, I'm in favor of a targeted SEC. SEC, targeted at the actual wrongdoers. And the current shareholders well, should no you, more. Why wouldn't you support the notion of holding the CEO or CFO accountable? But that's not what it does. That's not how but, it works. But you would support that in principle? If, if, shareholder, if management defrauded current shareholders and you held management, not the shareholders responsible, because again, transfers among shareholders does not deter wrongdoing. You have to, pun you have to penalize the people who actually did the wrongdoing. And again, Ken Lay was facing 45 years in jail. To think that suddenly you were going to say, okay, Ken, we're going to add five more years in jail, that he was suddenly going to be deterred by that, is hard for me to believe. Are you in favor of the Section 16 provision on, on disclosure of, of trades within two days by... This is part of the problem because, you know, and one of the things I actually think is, is destructive in sarbanes actually that continues is the disclosure of trades by large shareholders. And the reason I think this is structured, and of course, this is a continuation of the Williams Act's disclosures about when you do trading, non-management large shareholders often assemble large blocks to try to do management changes. And if you have to disclose that you're assembling a large block, like let's say you're a hedge fund and you're trying to change the management practices at a firm, you start buying shares. But once you have to disclose, management now knows you're buying shares and can start erecting poison pills, can start doing things to try to fight this off. I think one of the solutions has to be that we need to have a more competitive market for corporate control. We need to make CEOs worry that someone's going to buy enough shares to get them fired and take control over the company. And instead, much of our securities law that's based on disclosure is, oh, somebody's buying shares. We're going to let you know this. Okay, now that you can do, you know, erect defenses that protect current management. So many of these things are not anti-management. They entrench current management. Interesting. On that note, Laura Lee, um, I'm going to invite you to take the podium and, uh, and give the second, uh, second negative. Well, so far you've heard the theory of the Sarbanes-Oxley, and I'm going to start into what it feels like to actually implement and live with Sarbanes-Oxley. And I, you know, in, in full um, deference to my partner, the senator, at the time the bill was passed, I sat very strongly in that camp um, and was extremely opposed to the bill because I felt, and, and some of the questions coming up here now I think follow it, that you cannot legislate anything that will stop greed. You cannot legislate things that will stop bad judgment or even what is going to determine appetite about risk reward. And I think those that started with an opposition, myself in that camp, if you haven't gotten over that, that's a, that is not what Sarbanes-Oxley is about. Um, it very much is about a responsible control environment and a very clear delineation about, of the fiduciaries, who is responsible. And so what I'd like to talk about is what I think are, are four key benefits. Um, tone at the top, an empowered and qualified audit committee, a better control and process environment, and I will say as a CFO at the time I thought I had a very good control environment, so there's always room for improvement. And then, can you in fact have better audits? Um, yes, I think you can. So I think for companies that are still opposing or arguing against Sarbanes-Oxley, they haven't gotten down and said, well, okay, yes, it is gonna cost me money to start this, but what good CFOs and good management teams do is once they're gonna spend the money, that becomes an investment and they figure out how to get the biggest return out of it and I think that's what companies today are doing. So my first point is tone at the top. And the argument about a Ken Lay, et cetera, people can claim tone at the top, 
But what happens in a company, and bigger or, or middle size or whatever, generally there's a splitting of responsibilities. Companies are complex, and CEO's going to run out and, and grow the company, and the CFO's going to have the controls, et cetera. And the claim of ignorance, which was a lot of what was happening with that white collar crime inside the, the walls of a public company was, I didn't know. Well, there's no excuse for management not to know. And Sarbanes-Oxley has made it very clear that the C-suite is responsible. Now, they can have their separation of duties, but they need to dialogue and understand the risks and the operations of their company. And it gave some really robust tools to ensure that would happen. To me, one of the best is the disclosure committee, where the key business heads, the key finance heads, the key risk people have to get in a room or on a call or however they do it prior to an issuance of earnings. Is there anything that I should be aware of, you should be aware of, whatever, that could be going on that, in fact, we need to be aware of as we go to report, in fact, what we've done? All of a sudden, there's a discussion and a robustness and an awareness. Then you go to the certification process. Again, sign that name. Well, what you see is it isn't just the CEO and the CFO signing. I've signed my name personally for years. But when you sign with financial penalties around that, you want to go and will you sign and you sign and you sign. I want my chain of people to sign with me. That all of a sudden extends the responsibility of the fiduciary deep into a company and allows an openness that may not have been there before. So no, it will not stop greed, but it will clearly create an environment where if there is concern about bad judgment, about crime or whatever, it can rise safely to the top. The second thing I would talk about is that you had a clear clarity that the audit committee also has a direct responsibility for the financial results. And in order to do that, they need to be qualified. And I know we've had some other dialogues yesterday and so forth around what are other things that give good robustness into governance, one of which was more women on boards. I can tell you I have been invited to be on public company boards because I'm a financial expert. I would have liked to have gotten there because for other reasons. Um, but a lot of companies said, as long as I got to get a financial expert and people want to tell me that I need to have a woman on the board, I'll just get two bad things out of the way with one person. Um, but out of that breakthrough, more women are getting on board. So if that's a subtlety, um, Senator, you've accomplished that. Thank you. Um, but definitely there is an expertise. And companies are complicated. And the accountants are making it more complicated as they continue to change the rules. You need financial experts to know what's going on. But Sarbanes-Oxley also gave tools. The, the, what we endearingly call the SOX process actually is a really robust tool once it got sorted, and it took us three to four years to sort it, um, into the critical control areas. And very quickly, as a CFO, I can spot a weakness. An audit committee can spot a weakness. And what it does is it also focuses the audit committee to make sure I understand why these are critical controls. So enterprise risk management has entered that audit committee's discussion. That then opens up all the other risks that people start talking about when they want to talk about climate change or environmental risk or resource risk, because where are the risks in a company? So this is a process that gets embedded. A couple other very effective things. There are executive sessions with the key risk holders. How many times a general accounting officer, even a CFO, an audit person would have loved to talk to their audit committee, didn't have an open forum. They now have a private session, a very comfortable private session that is, is, starts with, do you have enough resources? Are there areas that you have concern? But there's an openness. And believe it or not, for many companies, a CEO did not sit in an audit committee. Today, they sit in that audit committee. I'm not telling you they're not on their Blackberries, OK? But they are in that room, and they know it's their responsibility. That's a whole new awareness about what it takes to really run a company well. 
The third one is control environment, and I have been proud that I think I've always had a good control environment. But again, once you get into Sarbanes-Oxley and the 404 process, it creates some really robust sets of tools. Um, Jones Lang LaSalle, at the time Sarbanes-Oxley was put in place, was in 35 countries. Today we're in 70 countries. In that period of time, we've done 40 acquisitions, some small, some large. Um, the Sarbanes-Oxley tool makes that integration so quick, so effective, and so powerful that you immediately know you've got a control environment into your growth as a company. And hiring a new finance person in Turkey or some other place, very quickly you can see if they're good. When you have transition, you can see where they're good or not good. You know where your control weaknesses are. And you cannot do that by roaming the world with an internal audit that's going to get there maybe once every three to five years. That is a real savings in terms of costs. So what I can tell you about what the Sarbanes-Oxley process did for us, um, by putting in a consistency across the board which enabled systems, in that period of time, we've grown our company three times. But the cost of finance in our metrics has gone down 40%. The original cost for the auditors to come in and do Sarbanes-Oxley is down 60%. We have not grown the overall cost of internal audit or the overall cost of external auditors because it's much more effective and focused. And so net-net, when you put those numbers together, the cost of Sarbanes-Oxley is a smidgen versus the multiples of costs that have been saved and benefits. I'll go to the very last one, which is audit quality, and that is really what I think there's a lot of noise now back in the system. I find it a little strange after 10 years. This is now coming back in as accounting firms are trying to self-regulate themselves. It is hard to self-regulate. Clearly, um, the rating agencies prove that to us. Um, I don't think this is the regulation. I think this is interpretation of the regulation, and I think it's very important not to critique a regulation when in fact it's an interpretation. And as this, the, again, it gets sorted, and I think it will get sorted, what I would caution uh, the PCAOB is that if you really want quality audits, you have to attract the best talent. If you make audit a place where the young and the brightest coming out of schools don't want to go, you will not have robust um, financial systems in the future. It used to be CFOs knew they needed to have that as their foundation. Um, and so we need to make sure that the accounting profession and finance possession, the profession stays at the top of its game as real contributors to the whole process of what makes a great company. Thank you. Thank you, Laura Lee. Very interesting, very interesting to hear from somebody who's had to, to live with the, uh, the legislation and for another view from someone who had to live with it before uh, ascending to the world of the think tank. Let's hear from John Allison. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I have a little different background. I started analyzing financial statements in 1971, so I and have been analyzing financial statements ever since then. In addition, I've been a professional in the risk management business. I ran uh, our risk management business, a $152 billion company. I'm a member of the, what's called the Risk Management Association, the RMA, which is the world's best professional risk managers. Of course, one of the risks we manage is fraud risk, so I have a lot of background. I'm an expert in fraud risk management. Uh, I happen to be a CEO. Uh, first problem with Sarbanes-Oxley is that there was not a problem that needed fixing. Uh, there was a lot of publicity about the problems in Enron and, 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 and WorldCom, but if you actually look at the statistics that the professional risk managers uh, were are followed for years and years, the losses were within the normal system expectations based on the economy. We were having a severe economic correction because of the bubble created by the Federal Reserve that Mark, Mark mentioned, and it wasn't really the fraud losses, it was the economic correction that was impacting the stock market. Yeah, fraud losses were a trivial factor, but we were having a big economic correction. In addition to the degree that it, 
it did fix a problem, it fixed the wrong problem. And it really focused on three things. First, it scared honest CEOs to death. Uh, dishonest CEOs were already, you know, if fraud was against the law, it's been against the law for thousands of years, you go to jail forever. It was only the honest CEOs that got scared. Secondly, transparency is not necessarily good if it's confusing information, as I'll discuss. And more accountants aren't necessarily good in terms of uh, reducing risk. There are no statistics to support that. Here was the real problem, which it did not deal with. The real problems in the accounting system itself. When I went into the uh, financial business and I was analyzing financial statements, we had what's called a principle-based accounting system. In a principle-based system, the accounts were responsible that the information was, you could understand it and that management identified the real risk. The SEC, which is attorneys, not accounts and not business people, forced a rules-based system. The problem with the rules-based system is easy to game the system. And what happens in a rules-based system, you focus on the I's and you focus on the T's. What happened at Enron, the accountants, uh, who were actually very good accountants, got focused on the I's and the T's and ignored the real risk because they weren't in a principle-based system. They were in a, in a, in a rules-based system. If you actually look at Enron's losses, and I've studied that, 95% of the losses took place before the fraud occurred. This is typical in fraud losses. Most frauds are not Bernie Madoffs. That's an extreme exception. Most frauds are honest business people that get in financial trouble and then do something fraudulent. And most of the losses take place before the fraud occurs in the first place. Enron, you can argue whether they were honest people or not, but they were technically complying with the rules and the accountants were focused on the rules instead of the principles. By the way, the exact same thing happened at both Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Bear Stearns had a technically correct system with a huge amount of off-balance sheet risk. Under the technical rules, that was, quote, good accounting. Principle-based accountants would have said, wow, if something happens in these off-balance sheet entities, it's going to take you down. It had to be put into the balance sheet, and Bear Stearns never could have done what they were done. And that was after Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, more information is not necessarily good information. Uh, one of the things that Steve Jobs showed us all with iPads, simplicity, which actually takes complexity and makes it understandable, is better. I'm a financial expert. I've been analyzing financial statements for 40 years. I cannot read the financial statement for Citigroup, and I don't believe anybody in this room can. It's too complex. It's all about details. It's all about disclosure of stuff that makes no sense. And the management of Citigroup can't read it. If we had a rationally designed accounting system, there would be principles there that would look at real risk that an average intelligent person could understand. So the fundamental problem, and any expert will tell you this, is in the design of the accounting system, which is burying you with ununderstandable uh, un, un, un information. Independence is also an illusion. Somebody walking around on the streets of, Sh of Shanghai is independent. What you want is, and by the way, Enron had independent directors. What you want is objective directors. To be objective, you have to know some of the facts. You have to be involved in the process. Negative results of Sarbanes-Oxley are pretty <laughs> significant. One, the cost is material and it's a huge redundancy. At bb and our internal auditors are audited by our external auditors, by the FDIC, by the Federal Reserve, uh, by state bank examiners, and by the SEC. So our internal auditors are audited by five auditors. Um, what's happened, of course, is a massive indirect cost throughout the organization. We think our run rate cost is probably $20, $25 million in excess of an already excellently functioning accounting system before Sarbanes. I believe in great accounting systems. Really good organizations already had them. They didn't need sarbanes Oxley to do that. We had an excellent system. Also, what really concerns me from risk management perspective is a misdirection looking at the trees instead of the forest. So you got all this details going on instead of having your operating managers really understanding the risks. They're focused on the accounting issues instead of the real issues in the business. In addition, by getting boards involved in accounting, you can actually spur less rational risk taking in the economy because boards in general don't understand the risk the organizations are taking. It may be actually slowing our economic system today. I don't know if it's possible. What about uh, misdirection of activity? This is one of the factors, this is a secondary factor, but one of the factors that caused the financial crisis, all the large financial institutions in the U.S. were forced to take all of their risk management resources that should be to manage and credit risk, and they put us in the accounting risk management business. So a lot of the things that got missed in the traditional risk management industry were because when they start threatening to put the CEO in jail, it redirects the organization uh, risk management strategies. Um, 
Mark mentioned less IPOs. Now, there's an interesting consequence. There's bad economics, but it also increased risk. When a company goes to an IPO under the old standards, they had to tighten up their risk management system. When they remain independent, the interesting fact is from an economic perspective, which is way bigger than public traded companies, because most of the economy is not publicly traded companies, they're actually more risk because they didn't go through the normal discipline of becoming a publicly traded company that existed before Sarbanes-Oxley. The biggest issue, and I saw this at Wake Forest University, is an incredible waste of human capital. We've got a lot of our best and brightest people aspiring to be accountants because it's a job you can make a lot of money, it's low risk, and it's guaranteed. And those same minds ought to be scientists, they ought to be engineers, so we can raise our wealth and well-being. We've taken a lot of great minds and focused them on the wrong problem. And that has got to reduce your standard of living in the long term. Now, the interesting thing, let's just measure sarbanes oxley by the actual results. The RMA statistics show that fraud losses in 2008, 2009, and 2010 were the highest in the history. So if you just look at the objective facts and look at the whole economic system, fraud losses have gone up significantly since sarbanes oxley Was that totally caused by the economy? Probably a lot of it was. We haven't had a correction like this to compare with going back all the way to the Great, Great Depression. But statistically, there's no evidence. In fact, the evidence is, is the contrary that Starbucks obviously has failed. Now, why should we have expected it to fail? The system was designed by, basically by politicians and by uh, attorneys. There were no real risk professionals involved in designing the system. There were people on Wall Street, but I mean people that had spent their careers in risk management. They weren't involved in the process. They weren't asked the right kind of questions. So if we really want to have a law, which is you can debate, the law ought to be designed by professionals, people that do this <laughs> and manage fraud risk day in and day out, and, and we ought to let them design the laws and then the, then the, 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 account, uh, the, uh, the uh, lawyers and the politicians turn it into law. So it is clearly a failed system based on the, on the statistics and numbers and the cost and it's redirecting human resources in the wrong way. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. We, uh, I'd like to put up the polling question again so that we can get the, uh, the effect of this debate on your thinking. And uh, John has to leave us now for, uh, for a media opportunity separate from this media opportunity. But uh, if we could please put up the polling question again. There were your answers before the debate. Now, if we could put up the question again and and the instructions on how to vote. Thanks. And so I'd like to start. Uh, we have a few more minutes here, and I'd like to open this up to all of you. So we, we have microphones, I hope, somewhere out and about. Great. Please raise your hand if you have a question for our panelists. But um, I guess I want to start with you, Laura Lee. I heard from John and, and really from Mark both that um, we have, you know, killed a mosquito with a sledgehammer here, that we have uh, uh, an inordinately complex system um, that has just created a kind of sclerosis. Um, you seem to think that uh, just the opposite, that you you've, were given a box of tools that increased the efficiency of your operations in aggregate. Can you address this question for me? Yes, because what you have to do is you have to break down your business into what are the con critical controls. And, in, and first of all, know what is a critical control and then see how it runs through your system and make sure that it all aligns around that. When you don't have it that thought out, what people do is they do the best that they can. It's what we call tribal knowledge. I mean, you know, that's, it's not repeatable. When you have something that's repeatable, then all of a sudden you can build in very quick checkpoints where I don't have to go in and investigate it and explore it. You know, if, if an external auditor has to come in and try to figure it out first, put the story together, and then see whether there's controls there versus is this a critical control? Explain to me why it's a critical control. Explain to me why this one is not a critical control for you. Um, then you can immediately go to the issue. So it just organizes a structure. And anytime you're organized, you get right to the point. Um, and you can, in our case, you can put it into a system. So I can, on some key controls, I can sit in a Chicago office, I don't, but I have people that do, that can online 
monitor, measure, and see whether that's all done in Turkey or Indonesia or something. It's real time, and it doesn't have to be checked at a moment in time, which is maybe six months, 12 months later, when it's way too late, but real time. Mark, she says it's improved her organization and materiality. What's your so response? Let me ask her a question. So you had no internal controls before Sarbanes-Oxley? Oh, we did. We had a lot. They were manual. They were okay. manual. And the thing about manual is um, they're highly dependent on people, the skill set, talent, and capabilities, which you are always trying to judge. But as you get more and more people, it becomes harder and harder to judge. We have 45,000 people, OK? Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, how do you have a tool to know you've made those decisions quicker and faster? And you feel like there never would have been an attempt to develop that? There's no need for that other than Sarbanes Oxley came and created you to do that? It clearly um, gave a higher level of purpose and focus. So for example, in a business, um, systems, the first check always goes to the business. Sure. It always goes to growth. It always, you know, finance will figure out how to get it done. Um, you know, there are the places that you get by um, because you can't make your argument about the payoff. That's been transformed for many companies. They can make the, the argument and they can see the benefit and you move up into a different place. And then, again, if you're clever and smart, which I think finance people are, you figure out how to then take those tools and be a better business partner that in fact give, they, you spend your time on the agenda of the purpose of the company, not the back room. And so this leads me to what I, what I think is a greater point because I think to some extent the title of the, the session and sometimes the debate is put out, you know, transparency versus no transparency and internal controls versus no internal controls. And, and quite frankly, I think that that's a straw man. I think it's a false choice. Uh, as I mentioned, and you know, people forget, you know, corporate disclosure was not created by the SAC. In fact, my read of the 34 and 33 Act is they largely took the disclosures that were being acquired by the New York Stock Exchange and incorporated them into the SAC disclosures and, of course, added liability to it because previous to that time you were simply delisted. And so the question becomes, to me, again, I'll repeat, we simply do not know ahead of time ex ante what the appropriate corporate governance or transparency regime will be. We have to figure that out. And so sort of my concern is, and again, I, I, I emphasize, you know, when again, Enron, Enron's a great example. Enron was not listed in Delaware. Enron was listed in Oregon. We have to, you know, so you have a different regime where you try to figure out what works. Again, we've seen lots of complaints in small companies, your company around the world, many other companies are not. And so what I would say is, A, you know, what would be the objection to allowing companies who aren't your company, who have a different business model, from simply opting out? I, I actually, I, I really want to hear both of your answers to that because I was intrigued by that notion. Senator, what do you think of that notion of allowing shareholders to vote to opt out? Opt out of what? Opt out of the regulation itself. All of the regulations? Was that your no, Well, I mean, you I, could I, start from that or you could start from different points. Piecemeal. You know, piecemeal. You could say uh, we could opt out, have a shareholder vote. And, and I would even be willing to say let's have the default say this is where you start from as a default rule. Well, it's an, in, it's an interesting point, but the impact is broader. When the WorldCom scandal broke, WorldCom restated then they went into bankruptcy. The stock market fell 30%. 30%. So the impact of the deficiencies in the activities of some of these companies and the, and the screening and the gatekeepers and all the rest of it, which is designed to catch that, prevent it from happening, the impact goes beyond the shareholders of the company. This goes it affects the, the market. This goes to this notion of the tone at the top and the culture, and I would remind you, Mark, you were, you were there, I believe, at yeah. the time. This passed the House with 400 and change, and it passed the Senate 99-0. What do you know that those esteemed bodies don't? Well, having worked in those esteemed bodies at that time, I, could, I think it's safe to say, outside of Senator Sarbanes, the number of senators who probably actually read the bill, I can count on one hand. So, you know, all due respect to that body, and all due respect, I mean, we did have a number of hearings. I would say the process is far more deliberative than, say, contrast Dodd-Frank. But that said, I also think that the process did not look at a range of views. I think the process looked at a range of, this is what we want to get out of this. We think the auditors are control here. And I'd be the first to say the lens that I look at this is an economist. And so for me, 
you know, if you, again, you look at the money supply, you look at the contraction of the money supply, we saw a big expansion to deal with Y2K, a contraction. Now, it's just as when the Federal Reserve today is talking about QE3 running up asset prices. That's an engineered decision to run up stock prices. That's what the uh, one reaction of the Federal Reserve. So I'd say part of the distinguishing is what drove the decline in the stock market? Was it macroeconomic and credit policy, which I believe, or was it a handful of frauds? And I would say, the Senator mentions after WorldCom, the vast majority of the decline after the dot-com bubble was before these frauds were discovered. And, you know, go, go, go home, plot out the Dow Jones. Go home, plot out the, the S&P. You can see it. The big decline was before these frauds were discovered. That's not to say there wasn't a decline afterwards. So it seems hard to, for me to believe that a handful of frauds were essentially what drove the decline in the stock market when I think largely it was macroeconomics. Well, the WorldCom situation obviously had a major impact on the market sure. and brought the valuations down very substantially. It cost trillions of dollars to investors. I do want to add one point because I differ with Mark on the process within the committee and what it reflected. We tried very hard to sort of do it the old-fashioned way. I mean, we were being pushed and urged by people pass something real fast, a strike while the iron is hot, you have all this upset over Enron and so forth. I decided, I was a chairman, I was a new, relatively new chairman of the committee, and I decided, no, we're going to try to do it the old-fashioned way. We're going to hold uh, these hearings, which I think I commend, that, uh, commend to anyone who's really interested in the subject. They were carefully planned and uh, carefully done. We. Uh, we worked over it in the committee. I think most of the committee members knew what was in that legislation. And some played a very constructive role. Mike Enzi, who's a Republican senator from Wyoming. Enzi, of the 100 members of the Senate, is the only one who was a CPA. He was the only CPA in the United States Senate at the time. I think that's still the case. and. Uh, he really took his responsibilities very seriously. And he knew his business, too. It was, it, was, it was really good working with him. In fact, we had one hearing. I have to tell this story. We had one hearing. We had three former chief accountants at the witness table of the SEC. Uh, well, I think it's fair to say that that was pretty dry testimony. <laughs> And at one point, a colleague of mine sitting over in this direction says, this is really boring. Well, he was right, but his mic was on, and he shouldn't have said it <laughs> in, into an open mic that resounded throughout the hearing room. At that point, Enzi, who's a very soft-spoken fellow, he, he gets into this conversation. He leans into it, and he says, it may be boring to you, he says, but I haven't had this much fun since I came to the United States Senate. <laughs> well, on that note, I never thought I'd say this, but I, I think we need more CPAs in the U.S. Senate. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, me, let me do one. Final point, okay. because we, we are out of time. I'll say very quickly. I, I do think the process was deliberative. I think we had, more, we had 11 plus hearings, and we had certainly a lot of witnesses. But the thing I would emphasize, and the senator has repeatedly talked about chief accountants and SEC chairs, we started from the premise of the hearings that this was a problem in corporate governance, that we started from the premise this is a problem with accounting. And so I don't remember a panel of economists talking macroeconomics. So we, it, again, the question was already framed with, that would get you to a certain answer. Now, of course, we were very deliberative within that framing. Understood. Well, I don't know if we changed any minds here on stage or out there, but I do think we deepened our understanding, and I'd like to join, uh, you to join me in thanking the panel.